So welcome back to the final plenary of today. Uh, if you just joined this afternoon and missed my intro this morning, I'm Yvonne Tuko. I'll be your MC uh, for the next uh, couple of days of the conference. Uh, I hope you've just come from a really uh, good session, a lively chat uh, of stimulating panels and keynotes uh, from the previous blocks and that you're ready to just kind of catch up on what everyone else was doing. Uh, personally, I attended the uh, uh, the Something in the Water uh session viewing party and honestly i learned a lot uh from all the way from like how community research how research com community research is a lot different than what we really taught in school to all the impacts that um that have been uh, registered and like basically cataloged in uh, nova scotia uh, so uh, remember that the session that you weren't in today uh, will also be available on YouTube on the Together on Some channel. So you know, don't, again, don't worry about the FOMO. All of these sessions will be recorded. You have the chance to basically uh, kind of get a glimpse into uh, all of what happened. And of course, uh, our partners at uh, the Future Future of Good will be sending out the, the daily digest later this evening. I'm going to turn things uh, right away to uh, Jacob Berkowitz and uh, and his team. Uh, he's the Togethers on some lead helper. If you missed my intro this morning, uh, and his team uh, will be doing uh, an, again another quick overview and summary of the what uh, what happened in the other conversation and chats that you weren't didn't have the chance to be part of. Uh, I introduced Jake earlier today, so if you missed that, you can check you can check out all of his work at jacobberkowitz.com. I'm going to put uh, that exact link in the chat uh, right after I pass it over to him. And yeah, uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to pass it on to uh, Jacob so he can uh, basically uh, talk more about the report and uh, the quick overview from the last blog. Thanks, Yvonne. And um, yeah, so I'm the uh, lead rapporteur for writing the uh, report. The first time I've ever written a report based on a, an a, vir a virtual conference. Uh, it's going to be very interesting. One of the things I found amazing in the last session, I was participating in the uh, cities and COVID session with three mayors, one from Kitchener, Waterloo, Victoria, and uh, Saskatoon. Absolutely amazing conversation. And part of the reason it was such a great conversation uh, driven by the participants' uh, questions thrown up through the, uh, the Q&A link. And uh, I think those questions made for a very, um, a, a very visceral kind of grounded conversation with some really interesting uh, diverse opinions uh, coming out. So keep those uh, questions coming during the, uh, during the, during the sessions. Um, and as I mentioned, working with, uh, I'm the lead rapporteur, working with an amazing group of uh, six rapporteurs from uh, U Laval and um, University of Waterloo. Their job is to listen in very carefully to the session that, uh, that they attend. So one of the past uh, four. And uh, then they have the challenging uh, job of in the last 15 minutes, while you might've been grabbing a coffee or um, uh, going, stretching your legs, they were condensing 45 minutes of conversation and uh, presentation into a three or four minute summary that we're now going to hear from uh, each and we're gonna follow the uh, plenary schedule. So we'll begin with the presentation that uh, Thomas Homer Dixon gave on a world tipped on its side, the pandemic and cascading shocks and our rapporteur is Annika Zalmi. So I'll turn it over to uh, Annika. Hi everyone. So um, as uh, Jake shared, uh, my name's Anika and I was part of the session run by Tad Homer Dixon on the pandemic and cascading shocks. And this session really looked at kind of the ways that the pandemic and climate change are actually quite intricately connected and how one small thing can create a bunch of cascading shocks. Um, we started off talking about how as humans, we ch face many challenges and they combine and multiply in force. So for example, um, population can lead to environmental degradation because of humans using um, the environment or sprawl, urban sprawl. Um, that, and then there's also income inequality or instability, social instability, regime instability. Um, and this makes us understand that there is a domino effect with um, one thing leading to many others. This can be reinforced or mitigated by feedback loops that can either enhance or dampen the effect of the original change. So for example, the pandemic would then 
affect the economy, which would then affect energy systems, which would then affect food, which would then affect democracies. Um, and we see this, for example, through the way that the pandemic has affected the economy. We've seen kind of an international dampening of the economy, um, which then affects um, the fossil fuel and petroleum supply and demand in those industries, um, and then food prices increasing because of the supply chain breakdowns, and then some regimes that are leaning authoritarian as a way to kind of double down as the pandemic for a tool to reinforce authority. So the example given there was Hungary. Um, so we're kind of looking at how one small thing, relatively small thing like a pandemic can lead to much larger effects internationally. And um, Tad was sharing some of the work that he does with the Cascade Institute, which looks at these complex systems and these, um, these cascades um, to understand where there are opportunities for high level intervention to then shift these cascades towards a positive outcome. We kind of understand the world in this equilibrium and this equilibrium can change or kind of like on a tipping point. Um, these equilibriums can change as a result of a series of long-term pressures that kind of shift um, the equilibrium in another direction or a shock that suddenly changes the equilibrium to a different situation. The pandemic has kind of put us in this cusp of either going into an equilibrium of social division or one of social solidarity. And so when we're looking at the pandemic and how it le relates to climate change, there are so many opportunities for positive intervention, provided we take advantage of the opportunity to really capitalize on these. Um, the, there's three specific um, opportunities that we have um, that were highlighted. So firstly, focusing on economic economic recovery, specifically on transforming the economy and the underlying energy systems to ones that are more sustainable and healthy. Secondly, um, enhancing credibility and legitimacy of experts and scientists. And finally, demonstrating that effective and rapid action by government is possible and thereby challenging the notion that um, climate change uh, action or climate action isn't necessarily something that's realistic. So it's a really interesting um, session and uh, I'm happy to have shared these thoughts. That was exactly three minutes. That was uh, very, very impressive. Speaking of uh, equilibrium and the paths we take, I think that uh, uh, Anika's um, Summary of that uh, presentation, I felt like I was there and I also felt a perfect setup for the um, summary of the next one, this whole question of the choice of the paths we take, because the next uh, session that's going to be summarized is business leadership to ca catalyze positive and lasting change. And uh, our rapporteur for that session is Victoria Tan. So I'll pass it over to Victoria. Alors, merci beaucoup, Jacob. Bon, bon après-midi à tous. Donc, le panel le leadership des entreprises pour catalyser un changement positif et durable a été mené par Cynthia Shanks, donc de Curry Canada, M. Brian Gallen de Global Canada et Mme Pauline Damboise, donc du mouvement, euh, et, euh, du mouvement des Jardins. Deux questions ont été traitées durant ce panel. Pour la première question, c'est où sommes-nous et où allons-nous? Comment les entreprises peuvent se positionner pour atteindre ces objectifs et cette vision? Donc, le premier constat qui a été émis, c'est que les entreprises et le milieu des affaires reconnaissent l'importance des objectifs du développement durable, mais aussi de l'importance de changer la manière d'agir. Euh, pas seulement pour faire du profit et de gagner, de croître, mais aussi pour rester en affaires. On constate que de plus en plus, les jeunes générations mettent de la pression et se tournent vers les entreprises privées pour euh, assurer que l'ensemble des objectifs du développement durable soient atteints. Euh, Madame Pauline D'Amboise a notamment évoqué que les agences de notation financière, donc des institutions bancaires, euh, maintenant font appel à des agences de notation extra-financière pour évaluer l'impact euh, des institutions financières sur le plan social, environnemental et économique. Donc, ça permet aussi d'avoir des investissements qui sont beaucoup plus intéressants et c'est ce qui est recherché de plus en plus par les investisseurs. Euh, pour ce qui est de Curig, eux, ils mentionnent que c'est important de diversifier les actions et les impacts. Euh, Madame Shanks a notamment mentionné qu'il est important d'éduquer de, de, les communautés locales, de favoriser leur empowerment, leur autonomisation, leur éducation, euh, mais aussi d'éduquer euh, les hommes et les femmes sur différentes problématiques. 
Par contre, il y a un défi, c'est que les entreprises canadiennes connaissent beaucoup moins les SDG et sont moins à l'aise. Euh, par contre, au Canada, de plus en plus, on peut constater que les gens trouvent que c'est important et on accorde une plus grande importance que les entreprises américaines. En tant que Canadien, on est fier, on est content, mais c'est aussi notre devoir de supporter les entreprises. M. Gallant a notamment mentionné qu'on doit pas seulement se concentrer sur le marché américain pour diversifier nos produits, mais aussi de s'assurer qu'on intègre d'autres marchés pour euh, s'assurer des objectifs de développement durable. Finalement, pour ce qui est de la COVID-19, on constate que de plus en plus, les entreprises désirent une orientation claire, une stabilité politique, donc de collaborer avec les différentes parties prenantes, les différentes industries, mais aussi d'avoir des orientations politiques qui sont claires pour assurer une croissance qui est responsable et une économie qui est beaucoup plus équilibrée. Donc, merci beaucoup et je vous invite à voir le panel qui va être diffusé en différé. Merci bien, Victoria. Je vais juste... Euh... Et la prochaine, c est, c est, une fois de plus, c'est une très bonne um, uh, bridge, uh, notre prochaine, parce que les, the mayors of the various uh, cities in the next session talked quite a bit about the, um, the, their relationships with the businesses and their communities in relation to uh, to COVID. So um, for the next session, the summary is about cities, climate, and COVID, managing a future with multiple threats. And our um, rapporteur is Tia Brierly. I'll pass it over to you, Tia. Thanks, Jake. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Tia Brierly, and I'm from the University of Waterloo. Uh, the talk I titled, what I watched was titled Cities, Climate, and COVID, Managing the Future with Multiple Threats, where we were joined by four mayors from across the country who were able to speak about their experience this far and what their plans are moving forward. Overall, it was a very interesting conversation full of experiences and plans in all these cities, and I was able to learn a lot personally. We were joined by Charlie Clark of Saskatoon, Lisa Helps of Victoria, and Barry Vibranovich of Kitchener, with Rick Lautenberg of Nelson, BC, leading the conversation. First, I'll just give you a quick update of some of the highlights of where some of these cities are in relation to the pandemic. So in Kitchener, as an emergency was declared early, they focused on vulnerable community members first and had a, different opportunities arise in several sectors from tech to health and health sciences. In Saskatoon and Victoria, they're in the first stages of opening things back up. With everybody locked down early, uh, things are able to now be opened back up with some restrictions. Overall, we talked a lot about how we bring people together during these times and how we really need to put faith into the system and how challenging this can be um, and how you really have to understand people's perspectives. To deal with this, we talked about different communication paths we can have that find um, and finding language that doesn't alienate people. Uh, we really focused on figuring out the best ways forward to build these communities. Uh, during these uh, unprecedented times. Next, we talked about the fundamental roles that the local government plays in the recovery of our community. Um, and we talked a lot about how the local governments are decisive and action oriented and how important this is and crucial in continuing forward past these, again, unprecedented times. It's also important to note that we spoke a lot about how NGOs can communicate effectively with the local governments during this time, highlighting that the ideas that we bring to the table need to be focused on what's already happening in these communities and what we can really do to be the most beneficial. We talked about some highlights in these communities, so I wanted to highlight a big one that was brought up by Charlie of Saskatoon, where they're trying to build a low emissions community plan. They're looking at how to reduce their emissions 80% by 2050, which is huge. So COVID presented a unique opportunities um, to problem solve and rebuild in the community with climate change and SDGs in mind. Here, they had a home builder association identify an opportunity to get people back to work by planning retrofits while also reducing their emissions. This was really highlighted um, the overall co-benefits of taking climate action. The retrofit example was highlighted to cover over 10 of the 17 SDG goals. The main takeaway as we come out of COVID, the main takeaway is that as we come out of COVID, we continue to address the climate crisis through the lens of the SDGs in practical and measurable ways. And lastly, we really see what we can do to shift our cities for the better in the long term. 
so thanks again. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tia. And, and uh, that was a session I attended as well. Fascinating. I found the discussion, you know, as, as you, um, you know, you mentioned this kind of balance that the mayors talked about between decisive action um, and the uh, reducing anxiety in their communities by, you know, and reducing polarization um, by in, in terms of their, their uh, through their role as as leaders and the balance between those two things. And um, so our, our last uh, rapporteur is going to report on the session. There's something in the water lessons from Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia's Enrich project. Let me uh, introduce Mohamed Koya. Thanks, Jacob. Hi, everyone. Um, so if you didn't get a chance to join the session called There's Something in the Water Lessons from Nova Scotia's Enrich project, um, I'll be giving you some highlights about it. First off, uh, the speaker was Ingrid Waldron, an associate professor in the Faculty of Health at Dalhousie University, who is the founder uh, and director of the Enrich Project. Some of the key words and phrases that came up in that session uh, were mainly environmental racism and the health impacts of environmental racism. Um, so to start off, uh, to give you a little bit of an overview of how the Enrich Project has been addressing environmental racism and uh, some of the intersecting SDGs. Uh, to start, the ENRICH project is actually an acronym for Environmental Noxiousness, Racial in Inequities, and Community Health Project. Initially, uh, Ingrid spoke about how the initial discussions around environmental racism were not really about environmental racism, but where people were talking about environmental justice. And so the Enrich Project focused on the fact that discussions could not begin talking about justice if the underlying reasons that environmental racism manifests in Canada uh, are not understood first. And so the Enrich Project is really an intersectional project that focuses on health, political aspects, uh, economic issues, and environmental issues. Um, and it addresses SDGs across the board from clean water and sanitation to energy sustainable infrastructure, fostering innovation, reducing inequality within Nova Scotia specifically, um, making cities safe, resilient, and sustainable, promoting just, peaceful, and inclusive societies, and even climate action. And one of the main things uh, I found listening to Ingrid was that she heavily uh, developed a lot of partnerships, um, but she didn't mention the SDG Global Partnerships, um, SDG, and so the Enrich Project definitely identifies with SDG 17. She aims to bring together politicians, activists, and, indig and indigenous and black community leaders that can provide perspectives uh, on government, politics, and legislation around environmental racism. The title, There's Something in the Water, is actually a book by Ingrid Waldron focused on the topic of environmental racism within indigenous and black communities with a particular focus on Nova Scotia. And legislation has been very important within the Enrich Project, where initially she was helping uh, to raise awareness and information about environmental racism by pushing forward Bill 111 um, within Nova Scotia, which was reintroduced every year uh, since 2015, the last time being 2018, and now the bill is Bill 31, Redress Redressing Environmental Racism Act. Um, and now, from that action, a federal environmental racism bill was very recently introduced into the House of Commons, and you can look this up under Bill C-230, which is, which is called a National Strategy to Redress Environmental Ra Racism. Um, it had, Bill C-230 had the support of Elizabeth May, uh, other Liberal Party members supported this bill, and uh, then the pandemic began, and so that's sort of the current status on that bill. Many partnerships from Enrich has been born, uh, including Rural Water Watch, partnerships with EcoJustice, um, Let's Sprout, the Ecology Action Center, Climate Action, the Nova Scotia Health Authority, all seeking to uh, raise awareness and education on environmental racism. And specifically, uh, the Nova Scotian communities that have been impacted by environmental racism and have been addressing environmental racism have uh, witnessed this experience over the last 70 years. Ingrid mentioned projects um, or events such as the Alton Gas Project uh, that seek to store natural gas in underground salt caverns and the community 
uh, in which it was what in which this was uh, being implemented went to the highest court in the latest step of their ongoing opposition to this project and ultimately in just March 2020 two months ago um, Justice Frank Edwards ruled that he would be reversing the decision made by the Nova Scotia's Nova Scotia's former environment minister Margaret Miller who had approved the project based on the community consultation when in fact the consultation was not conducted properly and the community had been saying for years that that had not been conducted properly. Um, there were many other communities affected within Nova Scotia, such as Boat Harbor, which turned into a highly toxic contaminated site after a pulp mill started disposing its wastewater in the community um, and resulting in high rates of cancer in that community. Um, if you're wondering about the definition of environmental racism, there, there were two definitions discussed, um, one being a more academic definition and one being uh, a more uh, colloquial definition or public definition led by a community leader in Lincolnville, Nova Scotia. Um, that definition is the practice of locating industrial waste sites next to African Nova Scotian native and poor white communities, communities that don't have a basic, a, a base to fight that. The academic definition of environmental racism essentially seeks um, to define across five categories almost, um, disproportionate location and greater exposure to, of indigenous and racialized communities to contamination and pollution from polluting industries and other environmentally hazardous activities, a lack of political power these communities have for resisting the placement of industrial polluters in their communities, and implementation of policies that sanction the harmful and in many cases life-threatening presence of poisons in these communities and a disproportionate negative impacts of environmental policies that result in differential rates of cleanup of environmental contaminants in these communities. This also included the history of excluding indigenous and racialized communities from mainstream environmental groups, decision-making boards, and commissions and regulatory bodies. And essentially, Ingrid, uh, put forward the fact that is that environmental policies can be racist because they are often created by members of the elite that do not understand how marginalized communities are impacted by these environmental policies. Essentially, racist ideologies are then written into policies, environmental assessments, and community engagement. Um, and that's it from that session. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much for Mohammed for that that, that uh, detailed um, you know presentation that really brought us there. And I think your focus on um, language and and defining language so that we um, begin to dig down into what we're really talking about, you know, is so essential. As a as a writer, I think about uh, COVID and how much you know what we're really talking about is the social the socioeconomic determinants of health. Uh, and you began to touch on a, on a lot of that. It sounds like a fascinating session and, and all of those sessions will be on um, uh, YouTube in a couple of days. So if you were really intrigued by uh, Mohammed's summary, um, that's, gonna, that's going to be an option that'll be available from the uh, Ensemble Together uh, website. So I'll turn it over to, back to Yvonne to, uh, to close things up for the day. I'll see everyone tomorrow. Awesome. Euh, merci beaucoup à l'équipe de Jacques, euh, à la merveilleuse équipe de Jacques qui était composée de euh, Annika, Mohamed, Victoria et Tia pour ces beaux résumés euh, et aperçus euh, vraiment complets des différentes sessions que l'on a euh, participé aujourd'hui. Euh, juste juste un, un merci rapide à, à tous ceux qui étaient vraiment, euh, euh, qui étaient vraiment euh, comment dire, impliqué dans la réalisation de la conférence aujourd'hui. Euh, nos panélistes, bien sûr, Jacques, son équipe, mais aussi les interprètes et aussi vraiment euh, tous les panélistes qui ont vraiment euh, su donner comme euh, vraiment plonger dans des sujets euh, vraiment complexes en, en, en moins d'une heure. Donc, on apprécie vraiment tout cela. Euh, merci aussi au Waterloo Global Science Initiative, euh, le Sustainable Development uh, Solution Networks of Canada, euh, l'Université de Laval, euh, où on était supposé être, mais malheureusement. Euh, merci aussi au gouvernement, uh, to the Government of Canada, uh, Sustainable Development 
goes from the program you will see uh, merci uh, au support du uh, Alberta Council for Global Cooperation Alliance 2020 uh, Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics some uh, je, I'm always struggling with this one uh, et aussi l'université de Waterloo uh, here, are few, here are a few things that you can look out for uh, for the rest of the evening or the rest of the uh, conference as well so if you sign up for the Webster Learn to Rap uh, workshop you can head right there uh, and use the zoom link provided to you in your event brand event bride registration uh, it starts again at 3 30 p.m eastern daylight uh, standard time so in about two minutes uh, tonight please watch out for the daily digest from our partners at the future of good uh, to provide some uh, top line uh, in case you missed it uh, moments to help you start your day tomorrow uh, and it will also help you catch up with all the sessions and all the conversation uh, that were done on top of all of the summary that we provided by jake's team uh, and bright and early tomorrow if you're on the west coast tomorrow morning at 10 a.m uh, eastern daylight standard time uh, future of good will host a, a twitter chat with john MacArthur, uh, brian gallen and kelly uh, kelly taylor uh, it will focus on canada's global responsibilities and yeah and so that's what we have uh, planned for uh, the rest of the evening again a uh, wrap uh, workshop with webster uh, head to that right away and yeah that's a wrap for today uh, thanks again for joining us today and remember uh, to use the hashtag together on some 2020 on all your social media and uh, yeah i'll see you tomorrow morning at 11 a.m or well, 9 a.m for me but 11 a.m eastern daylight time, uh, time thank you very much and have a great day and for those that are going to the workshop have a good one bye